Right, so today's class, so we will mainly be going over scattering amplitudes and good things. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, before we before we do that, I just want to complete the discussion. This is about uh, uh, the modular of things. So just to remind you what we were talking about, you know. Uh, um, yeah. We, we were regarding a complex manifold as a bunch of patches, on each of which uh, we have a coordinate system where the metric takes the form dz dz. Okay? The, on overlaps of these patches, we have uh, uh, one coordinate being a function of the other. Um, we want to match this up with uh, uh, some situation where uh, uh, where these uh, these 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 uh, where uh, uh, you know we're, we're dealing with metrics modulo conformal transformations, and since analytic coordinate uh, trans analytic coordinate changes give us conformal transformations, the kind of uh, functions that we are interested in are just analytic functions. Okay, so z is a function, z and patch m is a function only of z and patch n. Z bar back end is a function of Z bar. Okay, so we're in that situation, and we're trying to uh, write down the uh, factor that we get, um, the measure factor for moduli that we get, uh, in this language. Okay, we had it in the other language, that is, in, in terms of how the metric changes if you keep your coordinate matches fixed, and we're we'll trying to transform it into this language of real Okay, so let's. Let's uh, uh, let's do that. So we had a few formulas in the model last time, which I remind you of. The first was that uh, the measure factor written in the language that we had before was integral b z z uh, mu um, z bar uh, plus b z bar z bar z mu. And we have this definition of uh, mu z z bar. So we have the definition of mu in general, which was mu alpha beta is equal to g beta theta del k. All of this should have a k index. Yes, this mu should have a k index for, for the k module. Right? But I'm suppressing that. Yes, so del k, so that's del x like del t k. Modulus of G theta uh, alpha. Okay, and then we apply. Here we work in the special case where we were starting about the, the, the metric that we that we worked about was flat. There were changes as we changed the the pattern that allowed us to simply erase and lower things. Uh, so reason. Okay. Now. What we were going to do was to try to rewrite this in terms of changes in transition functions between patches. Okay? So suppose we have the mth patch. We have the mth patch. And we've got some function z. z. Okay? Now, as we go from t equals 0 to t equals 0 plus delta k, our coordinate changes from z to z plus v. So the new coordinate, z prime is equal to z, okay, plus um, delta t k, but I suppress the k index, times v. Okay, let's call this vz, we also have the z bar, z prime r z bar plus delta t times v. Okay? And this coordinate change has to be chosen so that up to a conformal transformation. So that up to a conformal transformation, the change in the metric is this change. Is the change generated by this element. That's, that's, that's the condition we want. Okay? So now, in the new coordinate, our metric is dz prime, dz prime. 
Okay? So now what we have to do is to take this 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 uh, this this metric in the new coordinate and rewrite it in the old coordinate and equate that metric with the slightly modified old metric up to conform transformations. So what do we get here? You see, what is dz prime to start with? dz prime is equal to dz plus delta t into del vz by del z delta z plus del vz bar by del sorry dz by del z bar delta d dz dz bar okay and similarly dz prime bar is equal to dz bar plus delta t into an an answer form okay. del v z bar by del z d z plus del v z by del z bar d z bar. Now we're working the first order of delta t. So let's find find the new metric. So the new metric, so d z prime d z bar prime. The first order delta t has two kinds of terms. There's the term that's dz dz bar, and that has one plus some stuff. The some stuff is is this del del dz by del z plus del dz bar by del z bar, both in delta t. Okay. Last we have a term that is dz dz We have a term that is dz dz and that comes from this with this That comes from this with this so we have del vz bar by, by del z and plus we have a term that's dz bar dz bar delta t plus del vz by del z bar So let's count, there are a total of four terms for the delta t, two, three, four, as there should be. This with these two and this with this. So we got. Okay, good. Now, the first question is what about the first term? Now, about the first term, that's very simple. You see, that term here can be absorbed. Well, that term is a conformal factor. Yes, because it takes the metric because dz dz bar and uh, uh, re is dz dz bar times something. We are only interested in changing the metric modular conform. So this term doesn't work. This is simply the statement that if we have a coordinate patch and we perform a, a change of variables on that coordinate patch, that is analytic. But that doesn't change the complex. Okay? So this part we're going to throw. This part we have to equate with the change. Okay. So this part here is to be identified with delta G Z. Del V Z bar by del Z. But delta V Z Z by the definition of this was equal to mu z z bar. Right, because this is delta g z z and then we get a z bar of that we previous. by 
This is yeah. So delta B Z Z Z is this times delta T and this time. Okay. So we identify then we've identified mu Z Z bar is equal to delta B Z bar by delta Z. And of course, symmetrically mu Z bar Z is equal to delta B Z by delta Z. Is this good? Now we have to deal 
and more careful in our engagement. So far we've been dealing with just one patch. So we've been allowed to be blase. But, you know, on different patches we can do different coordinate changes. And the coordinate changes are written with respect to different vector fields. So I'm going to put two indices here. The first one is M, which tells you that this is a coordinate change happening in the M with patch. And the second one I'm putting here is M, which tells you that once I've done this coordinate change, I've got a vector field. Now, if I've got a vector field, I can view it in any coordinate system I want. Vm's mz is the vector field of the mth coordinate change viewed in the coordinate z. Is that fair? That the vector field is this times delta del z. Is this clear? Now, what are we going to get from the other side? What are we going to get from the other side? Well, let's see. You see, uh, okay, before, before, before I work around, let me first work out. What? Let me work, work out the following question. What is the change in the transition function on this line? Okay, so what is the transition function? The transition function is what z m is as a function of uh, is z m of z m at some particular value. The transition function is the angular dictator coordinates between the m and the m of patch. And this thing is a function of t, but the transition function is viewed at a particular value of t. So the change in the transition function is del Zm by del Zn at constant t. Is this clear? But let's see what that is. You see, when I change t, That is the change in ZN. But 
Zeynep is not the only thing that changes. Zeynep also changes. Okay? How much does each change? So delta Zn is equal to this. Delta Zn is equal to Bn in by delta T of C. Same formulas for the different patch. Yes. So I, you know, what I'm asking is I'm fixing a point in the manifold. I'm asking how does the value of z change? Right. So it depends on two things, the t and z n, because there will be another line. No, no, I'm fixing a point on the manifold. Okay. So I stick at the same point and I ask at that point as I change t, how much does z change? That is completely intrinsic. That's intrinsic to the element batch. It has nothing to do with it. Okay. Similarly, I fix on the same point of the manifold and ask, how much does Zn change as I change t? That's also completely intrinsic. It's got only to do the nth batch. Nothing to do with the nth batch. And it's given by this form. Now what I want to know is, how much does this function change? Okay. It's a line. I don't understand. No, I mean, that thing that you the M and this function is this function. But pictorially, can I think of this as this function will be evaluated on the back. Okay. Now, uh, how much does the function change? Well, firstly, Zn changes because the value changes. So clearly, there's a part of the change in Zn, which is just Vmm times like that thing. But, you see, the argument of the function has changed. This is now to be equated with delta of the function Zn, not evaluated at Zn, but evaluated at Zn plus Vnn delta t. Everything is now up there. T plus that. Is this clear? So, the change in Z is this much, but that is the change in the function, not at Z, but at Z plus V and delta P. Because the argument inside the function has also changed. So, the change in the function at Z. So delta Zn at Zn is equal to delta t into Vmn minus what you get by the like you take the limit. Okay? Minus del Zm by del Zn at constant t times Vn. It gives you this object. Del Z M Del Yeah, so this object is equal to that. That's a form. Is this clear? Exactly what we get by doing this integral. 
You see, you saw that by doing the integral over the mth batch, we got v m in the end. Uh, integrated over uh, dz. Yeah, if you visit over the nth batch, you get vn in the nth coordinate integrated over vzn, which is the same thing as vn in the mth coordinate integrated over vzm. Okay? This is just a coordinate change in that, sir. So that's basically you want to evaluate everything in the same to feed you, in the end you evaluate the same one. And because one of these goes, you know, clockwise, the other goes counterclockwise, there's a minus to So, if you do this thing on this patch, on this line, the part that you get from this patch and the part that you get from this patch combined together will give you exactly this object. Which is the change in the transition function along the line. Precisely it says, these are head by Delta F by delta T, uh, Okay? So, we see that the full answer here, I mean the whole of it part is 1 by 2 pi, times B Z Z, del Z M by del T, at constant zn. Changes the transition function. This is over the mn along this line. Then this will take over with del zm by del t at constant zq. And so the whole thing will be closed. It will be some closed edge. Let me do the now. Okay? So this is the answer. This is the answer for what the insertion in the path integral has to be when viewed as a function of the transition functions, in terms of the transition functions. Okay? by how the patches act. And uh, how you choose this, you know, precisely does not depend just by holomorphism. This is holomorphism. This is You think about this uh, BB point. No, you see, the original thing was completely independent of how you chose to slice things up. That is my, so, um, that, so it is Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There may be something to check But it has to work. See, one thing that's clear is that if you take this shape, this thing and wiggle it around, it's it. it can't change it because of holomorphs. You see, this is a holomorphic function. You move it around, you get the same answer. Uh, then maybe we may have to think more about moving this point. This point. No. Okay. So uh, now let's try to work out. Now let's try to work this whole thing out in a very simple case. This simple case is going to allow us to you know, put all the moduli of our scattering amplitude on it. So if you remember what we had, we had the, our our, mm, our rebound surface at some point, right? And then, if you remember long, long ago when we actually looked at the path integral and tried to fix all the additional degrees of freedom and so on, and so on, and we found that we had to integrate the vertex operators. Some of the integrals of the vertex operators we can use, we use the unfixed diffeomorphisms options to fix. The other ones we still had to integrate, the positions. Now, you know, unified thing, way, of, way of thinking of this is to think of the um, the um, uh, manifold over which we look at integrals is the space of Riemann surfaces with a set number of punctures. And associated with each puncture, there is a new modulus. 
which is basically the position. Okay? So, instead of, you know, what, that's the way we're going to view the scattering. We're going to view the scattering amplitude as an amplitude that has an integral over this. Uh, Hello? Yeah, hi, Ram. I'm Ram teaching a class at the moment. Can I call you back in? Yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, great. Uh, so, uh, we've got these, we're going to think of this is modularly space of Riemann surfaces with as many punctures as there were vertex operated insertions. And integrate over the whole moduli space of that many marks. Now, how do we associate a mod this modulus with the position of the function? You see, the position of the function, as we said, is just where in a particular patch that puncture happens to be. So, say we've got the end of the patch, and we've got a puncture, that puncture can be anywhere. Okay? So, what we can do is just surround this puncture by its own patch. Okay? And make the coordinates say this is Z. I'll describe some new coordinate system, let's say Z alpha. Okay? So that Z alpha is simply equal to Zm plus some shift, Z. How much you shifted tells you where exactly the, the, the insertions. So let's say this again. In our new coordinate system, the Z alpha coordinate system, our insertions are always at the function. The fact that it can be wherever it wants on this patch is important in this coordinate. Okay? Good. So for this simple case, the this coordinate system is entirely in the bigger, this, this coordinate patch is entirely within the, the bigger coordinate. very simple. This pink line is just this. Okay? Also, del Z, del Z M, delta, delta Z, no? It's a parameter of how much you shift, how much the modulus has changed. Del Z M and delta P is just a constant. Because it's a linear shift. Okay? Okay? So, let me call this T. T is the position of the insertion. Which is different from the parameter T. No, it's the same. Because it's a modulus. This modulus is associated with this particular puncture section. That's why I'm calling it. It's not a modulus of the Riemann surface, it's a modulus of the puncture. But it's one of the moduli of the puncture Riemann surface. Okay? So what I was supposed to do is evaluate del Z n by del T. I evaluate del Z n by del T. In this case, it's like alpha by del T. I get a constant. And so, the insertion is integral dz, dzz, with nothing. And this integral goes over this contour. Goes over a contour that's around the insertion. Over a contour C that has, has the insertion. The insertion has some operator, so the insertion operator. Now let's see how this compares to the old rules for scattering activity. Clearly, because this is one of the body types, the problem this is one of the integrated vertex objects. Okay? It's one of the integrated vertex operators, and therefore, according to our old rules, we shouldn't have had a C insertion in that operator, should have just been the super conformal, I mean, the conformal primary. The matter conform, the prime, conformal primary. But now, we have to recover that old rule with this rule. 
So what, what should this alpha be? It's easy to see what it should be. If alpha is equal to over times c, let's call it c then. Suppose alpha is equal to c times o, where o is the component primary, the matter component primary. Then what do we get here? We get dz. Uh, and then we pick out the pole of the B of OP. But O is purely in the matter sector. So there are no singularities between B and O. So the only thing that we really get here is C. So we get up to some signs. We get O by Z plus O plus homomorphic. And so we will get O. So we will have integral over the we will have integral of dt, that's the position of the insertion, and no. Reproducing our old rule. Old rule says that you should insert just the conformal primary and integrate it over the world sheet without the seeds. So this is very nice. This tells us that if we think of insertions in this way, Okay, insertion is associated with modularity of the function in our surface. Then the operator that we have to insert is C times O. That is always the rule is that for all operators, you insert the operator for all scattering amplitudes, for all insertions, you insert the operator that is dual to the to the given state of the component. Okay? But you have to integrate over the moduli of all you know, the full moduli space of the theory. So some of these operators, those that correspond to the moduli, are surrounded by the appropriate modulus weighting factor. That appropriate modulus weighting factor in this case is just integral B, which kills us. Therefore, recovering the unit. Okay? So our new rule goes as follows. The either uh, write down the integral integrated version of the operator or uh, write down C times the operator with the B insertion of With the appropriate B insertion for the modulus. So we think all moduli now are equal to the modulus of the Riemann surface as well as the moduli associated with the functions. So this in some sense is the match, the nicest and most geometrical formula that's kept. Okay? It involves an integral over a modular space, which is the modular space associated with n puncture Riemann space. For every modulus in this integral, there is an associated prefactor. In some way of parametrizing this modular space, you can get rid of some of these modular things rather easily at the expense of killing these C's. But abstractly, it's just this integral over this n puncture Riemann surface with with the B insertions that we have understood. Could you imagine what the C is over Sorry. C is the gross field of the string. O is the super, is the conformal primary that corresponds to the state of the Okay. So the operator that you have to insert here is C times the conformal primary. Okay. So that when we do the integral over B, that kills the C and gives you just a Okay, now we should have had all of this discussion like a year ago. Uh, we did because at that point we just had some abstract some some way of making some well-defined formula look more pleasing to some ways. But uh, now it, it was useful to have this discussion. This is often the way things go with abstract stuff. You know, people with a certain inclination, and that, that includes me, then they think, oh, well, this is just some fancy way of saying something I know, so I'm not interested. However, that fancy way is often useful for the The thing that you know, you know in a particular way, you say it in some slightly fancy way that allows you to generalize it in situations where you don't know. That's often the, the use of fancy ways. Okay, so this, this is one use in this situation. This fancy way of learning the, the bosonic string scattering amplitude has a natural generalization to the system. Okay? And this natural generalization, I will only talk about next class because otherwise Jyotirmoy won't have time for this. Uh, 
for this exposition of scattering amplitudes. Uh, but I'll just give you a, an address. The natural generalization will include, you know, always putting all operators in the natural topology of the Okay? And uh, introducing some, uh, uh, some factors for uh, co corresponding to the integrals over super conformal moduli. We will see what they, what they mean. And just like this fancy way reduced to giving us integrated vertex operators by dropping the C, that fancy way will reduce to our own rule of inserting appropriate picture changing operators. Once we, once we work it out uh, correctly, giving you a reasonable justification of this whole, whole rather ad hoc picture changing uh, rule. Also, uh, apparently allowing you're giving you a principle to resolve sort of subtle ambiguities that are that are either having or having to Okay, any questions or comments about this stuff? Um, next lecture we'll go through that super conform the super conform version of this. And um, I mean this insertion can be computed as you know something that is This insertion, this insertion is the most um, well you may want to think of like the B contour in some sense like that. I mean this is that you remove C. You remove C. Yeah. yeah. In some sense, I mean, the, the, no, I mean, the, I mean, for example, uh, can we just write this in terms of the JPI? Oh, that I don't. I've never seen that. I haven't tried to do it, but I've never seen that. I suspect that there was some immediate way of doing that. No, I, I don't. My guess is wrong. My guess is wrong. You know, the whole JBRST business depended on the fact that in the beta gamma, if you try to rewrite the beta gamma path integral in terms of phi and uh, zeta eta, there's a leftover insertion of zeta that we must introduce. And that was very important to this whole picture. Today. I don't know any handle of that. So I suspect there's no clean at all. So the, 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 at, at this level, there will be a clean analog in the superstring. Namely, there will be a clean analog of this formula involving integration over all moduli. But I don't know of any analog of the picture. Other, other questions or comments? Okay, so our plan is, the well, next lecture I'll go to the super conformal version of this. Um, I, I'll ask also for our volunteer for the subsequent lecture to tell us about the one loop amplitude of which it's discussed. This is the one loop amplitude that verifies that anomalies do cancel the strict theory. Appropriate F, B term. Okay? And then we will declare that we have uh, completed uh, our study of Pulsinski up to chapter 12. Okay? So we've completed the formal part of the study of string perturbation and produce, then we move on to the more, you know, the more immediately physical things about uh, in chapter 13 and chapter 14. And then we talk, we'll, we'll have some discussion of space time physics and then the discussion of the book. Okay, so we got through our intro, you know, the string theory cause of, you know, a rigorous string theory. Very rigorous and rigorous in my sense. That is that's something that goes through every idea, touches on every idea in some way. Um, has a part that talks about perturbative string theory. Okay, just how do you set up perturbative theory? How do you? Apart from one important omission, that is the sigma model business. How do you how do you generalize the string theory moving about the flat space? We will soon declare it. You know, we soon declare that we have uh, completed our study of, of that stuff. Of course, unfortunately, that study is just a prelude for doing anything interesting. We don't really care how we have to do computer amplitudes most of the time. But we need to know the rules in order to do anything interesting. Okay? So, uh, with what we will have done in this, after declaring victory, is, you know, completed the background so that. When we start doing anything really interesting, like ADS, EFP, you know, really interesting stuff, 
I don't understand. It can be shown that. What he can say is, as we have seen that. You know, so you, see, you have necessary background for doing the interesting things in the strength area. Uh, needs to. So, it's sort of a strange situation where you go through a year or a year and a half of course learning just to set the tone for doing anything interesting. And this is interesting for mathematical physics at the moment, not yet for physics. It's an experiment. But still, that's the state of the subject. And uh, uh, now you've suffered through the the technical, the technicalities, we come more to more immediately interesting things very soon. So it's pay off, pay off that. Okay, now, to the point. Oh, there's bulk over some, so that won't be pay off. Yeah, some compromise. Start off by some of this very bit from the last class. At first, I have been completing uh, certain three point functions. So, in the last class, we computed the uh, three point function of uh, in the uh, of three k uh, bosons in the type one k. Considering these PAs, uh, now if you consider these PAs, then 
this circle would be considering trace over T A T B T C and uh, this uh, and, and, the, and the other diagram one to two would also contribute uh, another trace over T B uh, T A and T C uh, and when I exchange these two vertex operators to get the uh, same same object, then I will get a sign because of this. So that is minus, and this will give me trace T A T B commutator and C C. So the result that we obtained in the last class, we need to multiply that by this factor uh, to get the answer. This is also consistent with the free theory. Is it clear what's the answer for the Abelian case? Uh, for the Abelian case, this commutator vanishes. And so we get zero. Zero. Why? Why is that the right answer? Uh, oh, there's no interaction between the two terms. Which 
screen vector and then you plug in the values here to obtain that. Okay. Either the values under the various thumbs is manifest. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, so however, here we'll be exploiting the Lorentz invariance, so we keep the half um, uh, So, um, so now we split this. Um, oh, sure. Now we split, split this correlation function uh, up into, into different uh, CFPs. The C the C CFP is obvious. It's the same thing that we did in the last class. This will give us a x12, x23, x31, um, consistent with control invariance. And uh, then uh, we have to worry about the phi's. So we have to calculate something like e to the power minus phi by 2, e to the power minus phi by 2, e to the power minus phi by 2. Okay. Uh, in order to compute this, we uh, recall some formula, which is like e to the power product of e to the power i k x. I mean, some formula, some analogous formula in the case of Kuzan, uh, which we had used earlier. Um, but there is some A's, let's say. This goes as some factors, x to the power i j, take x i j, k to the power, take a suitable choice of alpha, uh, i dot k product, i less than j. Okay, if we do that, then we'll find, um, so we have to incorporate the activate i's, and on doing that, we find this goes as x to the power 1, x to the power 1 fourth, half. What are the x's? This is, so I'm labeling this as 1, 2, 3. x's are uh, the two guys, this two, x1, 2, and x1, 3, and x. Now, could you, could you just argue out the, the 1 fourth and the half power? Uh, yes. So this is, uh, this is, okay. So here we have to identify k as i times half. Uh, in fact, minus i times half. Because mm -hmm. in the bottom formula, you have half prime equals two. Half prime equals two half. Times. I mean, half. Oh yeah, we're over two. So now, um, uh, so uh, so here I use k equal to uh, uh, minus i times. Um, minus i times half so k1 is equal to minus half k2 equals to half times i so k1 but k2 is going to give me minus of 1 fourth and k3 is i, just i. So with k3 with this is going to give me a half with a minus sign. So it's a yeah. And just a way to remember, you know, without remembering the formula, mm -hmm. uh, to remember a master formula, it's e to the power a times x times e to the power b times x, and if you have many of such things, it's just sum over e, e to the power a b times the two points. This is always true. The product uh, it's a formula that follows from Gaussian integration. Now the two-point function is minus log. Right. Okay. Yes. So the half to the half will give you one fourth times minus log, so x to the power one, one over x to the one fourth. But the half to the one will give you one. Perfect. Now uh, the next thing that we are going to do is we have to uh, uh, look at. Um, Let's look at the, okay, uh, so we have to evaluate something like alpha theta beta, beta, mm, beta one, two, sine, four different things. 
and you have the two theta from these two vertex operators, and you have a sine from it. So in order to do that, let's first write down the correlator between two thetas. So this we will do by arguing about conformal invariance and Lorentz invariance. Now this would be proportional to C alpha beta, where C is the charge conjugation matrix. And uh, so, in order to uh, uh, figure out the dependence on on z, uh, let's find out the weight of theta. Okay. So the weight of theta can be found out from this expression. This being a vertex operator has weight one, and e to the power uh, e to the power minus phi by two has weight uh, minus half to minus half whole square minus plus half which is equal to 3 by uh, 8, 3 by 8, and therefore the weight of theta is 1 minus 3 by 8, which is equal to 5 by 8. Since we have two thetas here, so it's 5 by 4, and uh, therefore the dependence is x to the power 5 by 4. Could you also argue that directly from the formula theta it has a matrix space? Okay. So uh, the okay. we can argue the we can of course argue for the x dependence, but this is different. So uh, theta in terms of the h is e to the power i. Uh, so i is some number times h uh, into e to the power i times some. Some number times h and so this should go as actually this number is important. So the number is always less than this half. Okay. So the weight of one matter is less than this half. What is the formula for the weight of each the pi k h? So it's x one two to the power k dot no, k one two. Just the Dimension, what is the length power? Oh, I see. I can do my function. I see. Yeah. I see. But what is the Just what is skinny dimension of it? Uh, so, uh, I, so I I times k times k. So it goes as k squared. It's k squared by the by two. Yeah, k squared by two. Okay. okay. So now can you evaluate the weight weight of theta, the skinny dimension of theta directly? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, fine. So uh, this is um, k squared. Uh, this k is plus minus half, so this is 1 by k. And how many h's? And there are 5 h's, so that's 5 by 8. This is the same. Thanks. Okay. So uh, this, this is the second relation. Uh, and also, I would like to write down the relation, uh, the uh, OB of theta with the uh, Sign. Uh, Jyotima, I suggest I'm clear what you don't need. I, oh, you need it. I need these relations and I'm evaluating this. So uh, let me clear. You can clear what you're evaluating. You need the relations, leave that. Just clear the left hand side. So I want to evaluate this and I have this expression. Let's look at the OP of theta. And yeah. uh, uh, you also drop a three point amplitude type on this yeah, more space. And start with the top.
Nu. Let's go see here. Let's see how it works. Now, uh, the three-point function that we were interested in. Uh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Give us the argument. So, uh, okay. Uh, firstly, what the variance of x is fixed by the weights. So how do you know that's a theta? Okay. So this is in the let's say in one of the diagonal vectors, and this is a vector, and we are taking a product of them. So it should have something like an antiviral vector here. Uh, I mean antiviral finite here, and uh, so that fixes this dependence, and uh, then the weights are determined by. Okay. Uh, it's just in Bose's language, mm -hmm. suppose I was looking at a particular term. Okay, so I was looking at theta with all the classes, mm -hmm. and psi with the mi minus. So suppose the theta had all the classes. Okay, so write that down. Into the power i by two, some h, yes. And psi was into the power minus. Uh, minus h1. That particular side. Now, what would we get from doing this? So, it will click only when this is h1. And uh, that would be like x to the power. Okay. Yeah. So, this would Yeah, but, but, uh, this is predicted out. 
Then, okay, let me, we, we have probably to argue. I have not decided it's the extent. I had some other argument. Okay, fine. So, uh, so okay, then, uh, then this is, um, uh, so this object now, uh, theta alpha, theta beta, theta uh, psi mu, I will use these two relations, this relation and this one, to uh, write this as, C times lambda alpha beta. And uh, what are the singularities? So as I take these two objects here, I should get a singularity which is like which was like to our half. So if I label them 1, 2, 3, I should get an x, 2, 3 to the power half and x, 1, 3 to the power half. And if I take these two together, I should get. Um, no, the rest of the thing will be determined by. Uh, so that, that that's basically the correlator. So the rest of the thing, the dependence will be determined by the conformal invariance, which is uh, um, in this case, uh, this is 5, 5 by 4 plus half. And so this is Five by four minus two by four, which is three by four. Two by four. Half the same as two by four. Two by four. Yeah. Sorry. This is minus uh, three. Uh, yes. Which is what you have there. Which is what I have there, and therefore it's three by four. Of course, I hope you also have the identity. The thing you wrote down first, the two by four. Theta alpha, theta beta also has their proportion by identity divided by x to the power five. I, I didn't mean that. Yes. But 
What is the way that the things you start? Hmm. Yeah, it's five by five by four. Five by four. What is larger? Three by two or five? Yeah. <laughs> so there's no singularity associated. The only term that is singular is the one side. The other terms exist in the OP. But they're not singular. Example of Logragan's rule: You take, uh, you know, you take uh, two chiral spinners, you get all odd forms. The odd form that you produce is the, is the vector, and then there's the odd form. There's a three form, which is psi, psi, psi. Then it's not singular. Okay. Oh, well, oh, just one more thing. Where is the final form? For I asked that. Yeah, I will. Excellent. Now I, I want to uh, ask you a question about this. Suppose I take one to infinity. Okay. I take one much la larger than, than uh, uh, two or three. Where is the dependence of this coordinator x1? Okay, so it will be uh, twice the weight of one. Yeah, so well, let's read it off from there. Uh, so let's see. So uh, here, if it's u i2 plus half, which is five by four. Five by four. Five by four. Five by four plus half, which is five by four. And you write like this? You write by 2 is uh, uh, 5 by 8. And so uh, so basically, when I take it far away, uh, the um, only thing that will uh, contribute, you know, if I think of bringing this and uh, taking an OP with this uh, composite operator, whatever, is the part of this OP where this ob object is the operator itself. And so that will determine the way to be. Yeah, it's yeah, completely right at the same. So it's clear to everyone else. Uh, you take one far away, you take the other group. Now, because you, you can expand everything else in the other group. It doesn't matter if it's 2.3.1, point, 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 point. Everything else in the other group, in an, in an OP, the, the, the only part of, part of the OP that will contribute is the part where the OP gives you the same object, because two point functions are there. And so it's a general rule that in any such correlation function, you take any given operator of the infinity, keeping everything else finite, and the dependence of the coordinate of that thing will be 1 over x to the power twice that dimension of that object. You can see that very explicitly in this formula. If you take 1 to in infinity, you got x to the power 5 by 4, which as you said was twice of 5 by 8. If, it, if you take 3 to infinity, you get 1 over x. And the dimension of psi is half. So half 22 is. Yeah, this will be a fact, a feature of all the OPs you should be interested in. All the all the queries. Okay, so um, so the, now let me enter the result. The result of uh, three point uh, uh, function of two formula. And now uh Jyoti, why 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 can't I have added anything analytic? Yes. And suppose I, I suppose I, I was you know you you showed us that all the singularities are introduced. But if I add some analytic uh, thing to this, it won't affect singularities. Why? Why can't it? Yeah. So I mean, um, one way would be to say maybe you were saying that this should be projected out by GSO projection, and so yeah. Okay. But we, this is just correlation function to perform it. Okay. So, so then, yes. then then uh, it will be like. Uh, so basically, it's the argument of polymorphicity. Uh, actually, I can. Okay. Of course, you, 
just calculate it. You calculate it, you'll find this. But you know, from, on general grounds, as you said, you know, OP is determined the singularities, you've written down something some very reasonable. Okay, so uh, one way to say it would be like I, I know what are these objects, and therefore I can determine the X dependence. I mean what the X dependence is completely in this OP, because I can calculate the OP of e to the power h, e to the power h times c to the power h. You could do it by explicit calculation. But there is a general argument that this allows analytic dependencies, additional analytic dependencies. We just said the general argument to this. Explain that. Suppose something is analytic, then how does it grow analytically? Uh, it, it blows up this space, but two point functions would not blow up. We have did you we had a general argument that the dependence on x1 has to be 1 over x1 to the power 5. Right. As x1 goes to Right. The dependence on x2 has to be 1 over x2 to the power 5. Right. Dependence on x3 has to be 1 over x3 to the power to the power 1. Anything that, that is analytic, that is, that is by which I mean has no further singularities, must be a polynomial. And so we grow at least as fast as it goes. Which, will, which is not Okay? So this, the behavior as, as things separate out, basically clustered in terms In fact, there's no one point function. Essentially, you can't, you can't add anything to it. Good. Okay, now, uh, now you can see uh, whether uh, the x dependence cancel because uh, we fix this coordinates and uh, we can check that. So here I have x 1 2 to the power 3 by 2 and uh, with that I need to combine x 1 2 to the power 1 4 so that that gives you 1 by x 1 2 that cancels with the c uh, contribution. Contribution from the from the component of both. And similarly with x 3 so this is half plus half, that's 1 by x, 1, 3, and cancels them. And with x, x. Okay, okay so, uh, so what is the final answer? So the final answer would be, oh, also this, we have to worry about e to the power i, k, x, this will be, <laughs> but it turns out to be, to be uh, just the delta function. The delta function is just one, that's one. Hey, we have to, yeah. yeah. And it another be just one for the same reason we talked about last class, right? It's right, right. You can also calculate explicitly put in the values then. No, but because k square is ours. Exactly. Because I mean x to the power will be k1 dot k2 and k1 